in general, um, it's often helpful for us to understand the relationship between the Laplace domain and the time domain. Because ultimately, a lot of the work that we're going to do, we're going to do it in the Laplace domain because the math is simpler. Um, if you recall, um, you know, differential equations become algebraic equations. And so it would be nice that if we could just we could just look at the expressions in the Laplace domain and know things about the time response without taking um, that function back to the time domain. And so one example that we've already saw is that the poles of x of s relate to x of t. In s, um, if you recall, um, poles are solutions of the denominator being equal to zero and the real part of the pole tells us the rate of decay or growth and the imaginary part of the pole tells us the frequency of oscillation. So that's something we've already learned. Two other things um, are called one, the initial value theorem and it is able to tell us the initial value of a, of a time function by solving this limit in the Laplace domain. This notation of a zero with a with a plus, that plus in essence just means just the instant right after time equals zero. And so this is relevant um, if you have a function that has a jump at time equals zero like a step. Um, and so uh, it, it's specifying uh, that we're going to take the value right after the jump, right after uh, t equals zero. And then we also have the final value theorem, which tells us the, the final value of a time function by solving a similar Laplace valued function. The first theorem only holds if this, this Laplace domain limit exists. The second, um, the second theorem only holds if the poles of f, s times f of s is less than zero. So what does that mean and why is that? Uh, in general, the poles of s times f of s can be real or complex. So in essence, to be less than zero means that the real part of s times f of s needs to be negative, needs to be less than zero. And the reason that is, is if the real part is not less than zero, if it's greater than zero, then that means that we have exponential growth because the real part tells us about uh, decay or growth. So if we have exponential growth, then we have no final value. Um, the limit doesn't approach a finite number. It keeps getting larger and larger and larger. So this theorem doesn't work. Similarly, if the real part is equal to zero, then it's like we have e to the zero, which is one. It's it's as if we don't have decay or growth. So um, we could have a situation where the the signal oscillates forever um, without uh, approaching any finite value. And so again, um, f of t may not have a have a final value. So it's important to always check those um, requirements um, because it, you could otherwise get um, incorrect results from these theorems. So let's go ahead and do an example. First, we want to find the initial value of f of t where we're given the, the Laplace function f of s. And so sort of obviously, in order to determine the initial value, we can use the initial value theorem. If you look back on the previous slide, the initial value theorem gave us that f of 0 is equal to the limit as s approaches infinity of s times f of s. So we're given f of s there. We can just subs that, substitute that straight into our limit. And if we look at this, we have an, an s in the numerator and an s in the denominator. And so those cancel. If we try to apply this limit, we can see that the numerator goes to infinity and the denominator also goes to infinity. And so infinity divided by infinity is an indeterminate form. Um, it, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, 
this, you know, if you have a limit where the numerator goes to infinity and the denominator goes to infinity, the actual limit of the entire function, it could be 0, it could be 2, it could be infinite. So intuitively what really matters is it's, it's not enough that the numerator goes to infinity and that the denominator goes to infinity. What matters is how fast do they each go to infinity. So um, the numerator goes to infinity linearly like a line. The denominator goes to infinity in a parabolic way. So the denominator goes to infinity faster. And so it turns out that this, this whole limit is going to go to 0. A way to sort of more formally show that, um, one way is to use what, what's called L'Hopital's rule, if you remember back to calculus. Or you can just divide the numerator and the denominator by the highest power of the denominator. And so by dividing by s squared on the top and the bottom, it's in essence as if we're multiplying the whole thing by 1. So we're not changing anything, but it's going to make the, the integral easier to solve. So if we distribute the 1 divided by s squared through the top, we get 1 over s plus 3 divided by s squared. And if we do the same thing in the denominator, you get s squared divided by s squared, which is 1. Um, 6s divided by x s squared is 6 divided by s, and then you get 13 over s squared. And so then if you take the limit as s goes to infinity of each of these terms, you know, you have a finite number 3 divided by something going to infinity, so that goes to 0, that goes to 0, that goes to 0, and that goes to 0. So in essence, we end up with 0 divided by 1, which is 0. Now we will go ahead and attempt to find the final value of our function f of t, where f of s is the same as it was in the previous example. And so logically, if we're going to find the final value, we can use the final value theorem. The form of the final value theorem is very similar to the form of the initial value theorem, except instead of taking the limit as s approaches infinity, we will take the limit as s approaches 0 can substitute f of s into this limit again. We have a s in the numerator that cancels with an s in the denominator. This is the result. Before we go ahead and attempt to solve the, the limit, we want to go ahead and check the poles of s times f of s. So if we look at the poles, that's the poles are what make the numerator or the denominator equal to zero. In this case, if you solved for those poles, you would find that they're equal to negative 3 plus or minus 2j. Since the real part of the poles is negative 3, it's less than 0. Therefore, that means that the, the limit exists, um, or the final value theorem holds. And that makes intuitive sense because it means that the, the system doesn't blow up or it doesn't oscillate forever. It, the, the response approaches some, some equilibrium value. Looking at this limit, since, since the function inside the limit is defined at s equals 0, we can simply plug in 0 into the, into the limit. And so what we'll have in the numerator is 0 plus 3. And in the denominator, we'll have 0 squared plus 6 times 0 plus 13. And so that, that equals 3 divided by 13. And that's the final value of this function. A way to double check the initial value and the final value, or to get more understanding, is to, to go ahead and try and find f of t. We will now discuss how to use the Laplace transform to solve differential equations. In particular, we can take advantage of the fact that the Laplace transform tra converts differential equations into algebraic equations. We can still solve differential equations directly in the time domain using the homogeneous and particular solution. Or instead, we can take this other route where we transform the differential equation into an algebraic equation, solve the algebraic equation, and then take that solution back to the time domain. And so this alternative um, can be preferred.